Jackson, uh, we've talked about in the past how certain um, presidencies are lower and all that. Okay, so Jackson's like second tier, okay? Uh, not up at the top, but he's right there with Jefferson, so we're going to see some bias toward him. A uh, good thing about that is he's a pretty interesting guy, if not the most interesting president that we will talk about. All right, um, so usually students don't struggle with this because... Like, it's easy to remember because he's just kind of insane, okay? Um, before we dive in to Jackson stuff, uh, I want to hit some background stuff with you, okay? So a phrase that you see a lot is new democracy or even Jacksonian democracy, okay? Um, when we think about new democracy or Jacksonian democracy, um, something that I kind of like trying to get you guys to think about all right, um, to compare like Jefferson, you want to kind of think like it's government for the people, like, because we called Jefferson the first common man president, right? So it's for the common person. With Jackson, uh, in that era, we want to think government by the people, okay? Um, because the average citizen is participating more in politics, uh, there might, they might even get elected, okay? And so, Jefferson will be our first common man president, and, Jeff, and Jackson will also be our first common man president in a different context, okay? Uh, because Jackson at least tries to portray that he is a common man, whereas Jefferson, he's not a common man, right? Like he's like this intellectual elite and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, so that's the first thing. Uh, second thing that we wanna think about um, is actually a book that will be an ID and a term for us later, okay? Because this book is not gonna be written until the end of the century. So I'm gonna use this just to kind of intro it, okay? So this Frederick Jackson Turner guy writes a book called The Significance of the Frontier on American History, okay? So the idea is, like the thesis, is that like the West kind of like defines America. Like Americans are always looking West, looking West, looking West. Right? So what we're going to see, kind of starting with the Jacksonian era, really, I mean, really with the Louisiana Purchase, like whatever's happening out west is kind of the attention of the country, okay? So that's going to be like kind of a theme that we're going to see here, okay? So we have that idea out there. And then the last thing that I want to kind of cover with you guys before we dive in is um, causes of this new democracy, causes, like immediate causes, what was happening that kind of changed everything, okay? So... Um, one is the, pa the panic, okay? Um, after the panic, people changed, all right? Uh, they start blaming things in the panic, like the Bank of the United States that was supposed to help keep the economy more stable. Well, why didn't the bank stop the panic then, right? Um, so we'll see the same thing after the Great Depression, like why do we have the Federal Reserve if that's what they're supposed to do is stop things like this from happening, okay? So that's one, Missouri Compromise, uh, that kind of changes things in the context of like, here's how I want you to think of this, okay? Slavery, all right, so let's say I'm just a regular person living in the United States. Before the Missouri Compromise, I don't really care about slavery. It doesn't really affect my daily life, right? Like, I know that it exists, whatever, okay? It's like, I don't even really have an opinion about it, okay? Then the Missouri Compromise happens. Now I kind of have an opinion about it, okay? I'm gonna vote, I'm gonna maybe support people who are for or against slavery, depending on where I live, right? I now have an opinion. And then something else is gonna change where I'm gonna be actively involved in possibly getting rid of or protecting slavery, okay? But that's in the 1850s, okay? So we're seeing that because, you know, the Missouri Compromise, people are like, hey, this, this slavery issue is kind of a thing. Like, we need to think about this, okay? So, you know, we have that. Okay, uh, then we have this new political age where we have the era of good feelings with just one political party, but we're gonna actually talk today about how that one party turns back into two again, 
okay? Um, so we're seeing that new political age where we have the two-party system, we go to a one-party system, and then we're back to a two-party system again uh, in today's lecture, okay? And the last thing, it's not up here, I said it earlier real quick, uh, universal white manhood suffrage. Universal white manhood suffrage, okay? So when we talk about that, right, universal means everybody, okay? White means this, okay? Um, so everybody who has this kind of skin tone, right? Uh, manhood means you have to be male, right? Suffrage, right to vote, okay? So if you are a white male living in the United States, you're gonna have the right to vote during this time period, all right? They're gonna get rid of property qualifications, all that kind of stuff that we saw prior to, that all goes away which leads to this new democracy, right? Um, so we have more people able to vote, able to participate, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so that's kind of like sets the tone for us uh, in this new era and what's going on. All right, so uh, today we're gonna start off with the 1824 election. There should be a slide, there's not, so you just write 1824 election, all right. So I'm gonna tell some stories today some of the, I'll probably go a little bit too into detail. Like you don't need to know all the ins and outs of this stuff. Um, I'll just go into more detail so you just have a better understanding. Okay. So prior to this time, or yeah, prior to this time period, the way that a party selected who was going to be their presidential candidate most of the time was through the caucus system. Okay. So all a caucus is is just party officials kind of getting together. Who do we want? All right, let's vote on it. Oh, this is our guy. All right, and then, then they put that person out, that's the candidate for our party, okay? So what has been happening over the past few elections, we only really have one party, because the Federalists are dead, okay? So Jefferson goes, all right, well, I'm done, so let's put my Secretary of State, Madison, I'd like him to be the next president. So the caucus goes, yeah, all right, let's, let's vote on it, yeah, Madison's the guy, all right? Then Madison's president, well, I'm done, um, I'd like my Secretary of State, James Monroe, to be president. The caucus goes, all right, yeah, James Monroe. We'll vote on it, pass, he's it, okay? So that's kind of what has been going on. But then we get to the election of 1824. Things are going to change. Because James Monroe, who normally would just go, hey, who's my Secretary of State? I'm going to put his name in. The problem is, it's John Quincy Adams, right? Now, John Quincy Adams is actually a really good Secretary of State. But we got a problem. He disagrees with Monroe on some things. Okay, remember we're in a one party system at this point. John Quincy Adams has some old school Federalist beliefs, all right? And people are starting to call these people in the Democratic Republicans that have these old school Federalist beliefs, they kind of start calling them National Republicans. Okay, and Federal, Federalist, right? National Republicans, okay? So John Quincy Adams doesn't exactly agree, all right? Now, where's John Quincy Adams from? He's the son of John Adams. Where is he from then? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, okay? So he's gonna be like a Northern kind of candidate, all right? The other guy is, I think he, I think he was Secretary of Treasury, this guy, William Crawford, okay? But he's from Georgia, okay? So he's actually a little bit more representative of where Monroe kind of believes because Monroe's from Virginia, this guy's from the South as well, Georgia, Right? He's got a problem, he had a stroke, he's blind in one eye. People are like, yeah, should he be president? You know, he's, he's getting sick and things like that. He's getting old, right? So they're kind of like iffy on Crawford, okay? But there's a third guy who wants to also be president. His name is Henry Clay. You might have not heard of him, Henry Clay. He's from Kentucky, okay? So Henry Clay wants to be president too, which he represents the West. So we got Adams from the north, and Crawford from the south, and Clay from the west, okay? So we got really three guys that kind of want to be president. Now, we remember the rules of the Electoral College. You have to have a majority of the electoral votes to be president. You got to get past that 50%, okay? But if you have three people running, what is most likely to happen? You only have to have a third or a little bit over. Well, yeah, you're only going to get a third which means nobody has 50%. But Henry Clay knows the rules. According to the 12th Amendment, if that is the case, 
the election then goes to the House of Representatives, and they will vote on who is the next president. And guess who the Speaker of the House is? Henry Clay. So who do we think is going to be the next president? Henry Clay. Like, this is genius. He had it all figured out. By the way, Henry Clay, super popular. He has one of these reputations that like he walks in a room, everybody loves this guy, right? He can command a room. He's like the most popular politician in this time period, okay? So it seems like Henry Clay is gonna be the next president until Andrew Jackson decides to run for president, okay? So let's talk about Andrew Jackson for a second. Andrew Jackson throws his hat in the ring. Thomas Jefferson famously says he is the least qualified person to ever run for president. And if he becomes president, that is the detriment of our country. This is from a dying Thomas Jefferson saying this. Okay? So who is Andrew Jackson? Well, Andrew Jackson, born in, I think, South Carolina, so like homeless by the time he's 14. Both of his parents have died and all this stuff. Ends up moving up to Tennessee, doing very well for himself. Um, buys his first slave, I think, like he's like 21 years old or whatever. So like from the time he's homeless at 14 to 21, he's like able to afford a, a slave. So like something happened there where he's being relatively successful. He continues to be more successful. Tennessee becomes a state. He actually becomes the first congressman from the state of Tennessee. At, in Congress, everybody hates him because all he wants to do is fight with everybody. Okay, so then eventually he runs for senator, he wins that, quits within six weeks because he hates doing politics. He's got, I don't want to do this anymore, this is stupid, all these people are corrupt, I don't want to be a part of this, nobody likes him there. Okay, so then he decides, I'm going to go back to Tennessee, he goes back to Tennessee, joins the military, goes down south, starts fighting against Creek, uh, tri the Creek tribe, all right, starts slaughtering them, then the War of 1812 happens. Fights at the Battle of New Orleans. Now he's a national name. Okay, goes back to Tennessee for a minute. Comes back down south. Goes, hey, there's a bunch of Seminoles over there. I'm gonna go kill them all. All right, so he starts marching around the, the border of northern Florida, killing Seminoles, pretty much a genocide. He's even more of a hero now because we, we gotta remember that the average American wants these natives to die, right? And he's taking care of the native problem, all right? Then, under the Monroe presidency, John Quincy Adams is negotiating with Spain the Florida Purchase Treaty, the Adams Onish Treaty is the official name. While he's negotiating that, Andrew Jackson decides he's gonna cross the Florida border, right? That's technically invading a foreign country. What does Jackson then do? He goes to Pensacola, and he kicks out the Spanish out of Pensacola, also murdering two English soldiers. So England threatens a war against the United States. Spain goes, hey, we're trying to negotiate with you guys the sale of Florida. This guy came in and started killing our soldiers and declared himself governor of the territory of Florida. What's going on with this Andrew Jackson guy? John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State, is going, we can't control him. We told him to stop. He doesn't listen to anybody. Meanwhile, Jackson continues to march through Florida, killing every Native American he can find until he gets to Florida's coast, and then they name Jacksonville after him. Okay? So this is Andrew Jackson. And now he's decided he wants to be president. Right? When Thomas Jefferson says this is a bad idea, it's because he doesn't listen to laws. Right? You can't invade foreign countries. You can't just go kill English soldiers because you feel like it, right? And so Andrew Jackson is a little bit of a wild card. If you are Henry Clay, you're going, I got this in the back. Nobody's gonna vote for that Jackson guy. He's not even a politician. That's why Jackson's gonna win, because he's not a politician, right? He's the first guy that runs. He's like, I'm not like everybody else. I'm the anti-Washington guy, right? Think about, not Biden, but the two presidents before, Trump and Obama. Do you know that's a major reason why both of those guys won office? Because I'm not like all the other politicians in Washington, right? When you can say that, people like to hear that, okay? But Jackson's just the first guy to do it. He's not gonna be the last by a long shot, okay? This is a common thing that people will do when they run. You guys are about to vote in the 2024 election. Watch what happens. I promise you, in each party during the primary season, there will be one to two to five candidates who are like, 
I'm anti-Washington. I've never been a politician in Congress. Those people are all corrupt. I'm going to be the anti. There's always going to be somebody that does that. It's a winning political strategy. Okay. So Jackson throws his hat into the ring. And everybody's not taking him seriously. All the people in Washington are like, it's going to be Clay. It's going to be Clay. What they didn't factor in was white universal manhood suffrage. You have a lot of people who haven't voted before, right, that are going to vote and they want the common man. Henry Clay is not the common man. Crawford's not the common man. John Quincy Adams for sure is not the common man. But Andrew Jackson is. So the election happens. Jackson gets more votes than everybody. And they're like, oh crap. But he doesn't get enough electoral votes. Okay, so Clay was right. It's going to go to the House of Representatives, where Clay is the Speaker of the House. The only problem is Clay came in fourth because Clay is a Western candidate, as was Andrew Jackson. So all the people that would have normally voted for Clay ended up voting for Andrew Jackson. And so because Clay is not in the top three, he doesn't make the cut. But he does get to help decide who is the next president. So Clay doesn't like Jackson. Nobody in politics likes Jackson. He disagrees with Crawford. So it makes sense that Clay would have a meeting with Adams. They have a three hour discussion. And the next day, Clay is out there going, hey, we should support this Adams guy. And there are states out west that all of a sudden are now going to vote for Adams and give Adams the electoral votes he needs to win the election. So Adams won the election. And what is the criticism from the Jackson people? They made a corrupt bargain. What was said at that meeting? Did they, did they agree to something at that meeting? And that's what the Jackson people say. Jackson got more votes than anybody. Why isn't he president? Now, it doesn't help the situation when John Quincy Adams appoints Henry Clay Secretary of State. Because the last three presidents all were Secretary of State before they were president. So if you want to be president of the United States, it's almost like in this era, be Secretary of State, and that's the launch pad for you being president. Okay? So the Jackson people, they're, they're back there and they're going, this seems shady. This seems like one of those corrupt Washington things. All right? And they will lie and wait for four more years until Jackson runs again. But it doesn't change the, what happened, right? John Quincy Adams is now president. All right? As far as John Quincy Adams is concerned, he's not a great president. He was a really good Secretary of State. Even after his uh, career as president is over, he goes on and does some cool things. But while he was president for those four years, not much. Okay? So let's talk about the main thing that happens with John Quincy Adams. Okay? We're going to talk about tariffs today. So we're back into economics again. We've talked about tariffs before. Who, like, what section of the country loves tariffs? North. Who hates it? South. Okay. So, I have some figures on the board, all right? I don't want you guys trying to memorize numbers. And the truth of it is, just because it says 23%, that's from one source. Another source could have that number at 25%. So, we don't even get that, all right? Like, it's just, it is, like, around there, all right? It depends on how you want to take the average. But what I'm, I'm looking for you guys to understand is how these tariffs are rising, okay? So, watch what happens. Prior to... 1824. So before 1824, tariffs are right around 23%. If I buy a $100 item from Britain, I'm going to pay $123, right? Or I could just buy the American version for $100, right? So the idea, protect American businesses, I'm more likely to spend it on American goods. Okay, fine. 1824, while that election is happening, Congress passed a 37% tariff. So tariffs went up, okay? Now, John Quincy Adams is president, and he's from New England, which means he's fine with tariffs. He likes tariffs, okay? He's not going to lower this tariff while he's president. In fact, in 1828, the last year of his presidency, there's a new bill to raise tariffs up to 45%, okay? 
And here's where we start to have the problem. Because tariffs keep going up, which means that tariffs on American cotton overseas are also going to be going up. John Quincy Adams, as a vice president, his name is John C. Calhoun. Calhoun is from? The South. South, right? South Carolina, right? So when John Quincy Adams gets this bill on his desk and he signs it, John C. Calhoun loses his mind. Okay, now we're gonna pause right there and I'm gonna tell you what actually happened. This is not your book, all right? It's actually the Jackson people. Everybody who wanted Andrew Jackson that was on the inside of Washington that actually liked Jackson, they actually go, you know what we should do? We should get tariffs raised because everybody in the South is really going to hate John Quincy Adams if he raises tariffs up. So they won't vote for him. When Andrew Jackson runs for re-election, because he's a Westerner, they're already going to vote for him out West. So now, if you get all the Western votes and all the Southern votes, Jackson walks into the presidency, right? So the Jacksonians are actually behind this, even though they don't even agree with this, right? They're doing this to hurt John Quincy Adams' re-election because it's happening in the election year, okay? So now, John Quincy Adams is extremely hated by the South. His vice president is mad. The South starts calling this the tariff of abominations. And the vice president of the United States, John C. Calhoun, writes a document anonymously called the Southern Carolina Exposition in which he says when Congress passes an unjust law, states have a right to nullify that law. Where have we heard this before? Virginia Resolution. The Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions, written anonymously by the Vice President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts. It's the same story all over again. So here we have another situation where the Vice President having an issue with his president, okay? So the election happens. What do you think is gonna go on, right? Like, of course Jackson is gonna win this, All right? So let's talk about the election of 1828. It's interesting. Jackson, let's, let's do this. When Jackson's younger, he meets a, a woman named Rachel. Falls madly in love with her and decides he's gonna marry her. Now, he ends up marrying her quicker than what was normal at the time. And there's a reason why, because Rachel, this girl, she was married. She lived in another state and her husband petitioned for divorce. And back then, if you were a divorced woman, nobody wanted to marry you. And so Jackson meets her in Tennessee. She had moved out of her whatever state she was from, right? Goes to Tennessee, meets Andrew Jackson. They fall in love. She's like, listen, I was married. I, I got divorced. And he's like, it's okay. I'm going to marry you. And then like this terrible like reputation will go away. And people will just know that you and I are married. Okay? So he marries her. Everything's going great for two years. And then the ex-husband shows up. He goes, are you married to this man? She goes, yeah, we were divorced. He goes, we were not divorced. I petitioned for divorce. There's no official divorce papers ever signed. We're still married. And now Rachel Jackson has broken the law because she has committed legal adultery. She's married to two people at once, okay? So this is going to plague Andrew Jackson for the rest of his life because every time he runs for office, somebody brings this up about his wife and embarrasses him and her, okay? Let's fast forward. So this is like way back like 1803, like that time period when all that goes down, okay? So now we're in 1828. They've been married for like close to 20 years, somewhere around there, all right? Now he's running for president, okay? Do you think that's coming back? Oh yeah, it's coming back. Now, back then, you didn't campaign for yourself, 
Okay, you're not giving speeches saying vote for me, here's what I want to do. Other people campaign for you. So you'll have newspapers that support you, here's why you should vote for Andrew Jackson. You have other politicians, here's why you should vote for Andrew Jackson, okay? Well, the anti-Jackson people, of course, attack this Rachel Jackson story, okay? Again, this next, this next thing that I'm gonna tell you, it's kind of like the legend of it. I don't know if it actually happened this way. It's just like kind of like the story. Rachel Jackson's walking along the side of the road. She sees a pamphlet on the ground. It's like an election pamphlet. She picks it up and her name is on it. And then the whole pamphlet is about her calling her like a whore or something like that, okay? And like she is completely distraught by it. And so she gets so stressed out and anxiety filled. And if you know about stress and anxiety, what that can do to your body, and then you get sick, right? Your body's not going to heal when it gets sick because your body's constantly dealing with the cortisol and the, the stress and all that, right? Okay, so she gets sick during the election and Andrew Jackson wins. She dies weeks after Andrew Jackson becomes president of the United States. And Andrew Jackson for the rest of his life will blame John Quincy Adams people Henry Clay, all those people. Please excuse this interruption. Bicycles need to be locked up in the new bike rack, not on the outside. Church. Again, bicycles should not be placed on, on the outside of the new bike rack. They need to be locked up inside. Why would Thank you have outside people? Jerks. Okay. So Andrew Jackson will blame the other side forever. When Jackson has something against you, man, he's going to go at you. All right? So now Andrew Jackson is president. All right. So here, here's a, here's a way that we can kind of, I can show you how strong that he feels about his wife. Some guy, when he's running for like Congress or something, like a, a while ago, right, called out Rachel Jackson on this. Jackson, Andrew Jackson, challenges him to a duel. The guy's name I think is Charles Dickinson. Not Charles Dickens, the author, but Charles Dickinson, right? Charles Dickinson raises his pistol in the duel, fires at Jackson. Jackson, it's hit, it hits him in the lung, collapses his lung, breaks a couple ribs. Charles Dickinson, the, the rumor is, Jackson didn't even flinch when he got shot. This guy's lung like popped, essentially, right? Broke ribs, and Dickinson is rumored to have uttered, oh Lord, I missed him. Andrew Jackson raises his pistol and shoots and kills Dickinson right in the chest, done. Jackson will live the rest of his life with a bullet lodged into his lung. He'll go on to be president of the United States, all the while the bullet's still right there. Okay, which earns him the name Old Hickory. People called him Old Hickory because he was, he was tough as an old hickory tree. Right? He's the common man. He's tough. He's a westerner. He's a frontiersman. He's from Tennessee. He can take a bullet, and he's good. So everybody loves Jackson. There's going to be some criticisms. One of the criticisms that we can talk about is this kitchen cabinet. Oh. Oh, this cabinet. Oh, that's not victory. What? 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 What's happening? All right. So Jackson's kitchen cabinet. The doors opened from left to right instead of right to, no, okay, no. But so he has his cabinet, right, his normal cabinet, right? But he also has this second cabinet of unofficial advisors, right? And those unofficial advisors, they're not held accountable to anybody because they don't technically work in the government. So when they're advising him on things to do, destroy the National Bank, things like that, like, he's just getting advice from people. And at that stage in American history, you don't do that. The only people you should be getting advice from is your official cabinet, people who are into the government, who are part of the government, okay? So this is viewed as a very taboo thing that he's going to citizens and getting advice, all right? So that's a big criticism of him. Another criticism of his is the spoil system, okay? Think to the victor go the spoils. So let's say I was running for president, right? And for the most part, I think you guys would be like, yeah, 
I'm going to support Mr. T. He's running for president, right? All right? Except Munis, he won't, all right? Why are you such a jerk all the time? Just support me. Can you please support my bid for presidency? I, I can't make any problem. <sighs> all right. So let's say you guys are out there campaigning for me. All right. What you should expect under the spoil system is I'm going to hook you up with a nice job in the government after we win this thing. Do we still have this process today? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In 2024, that first election that you guys get to vote in, go look at who's really supportive of the person running. Okay. Because when they win, they're going to be in the cabinet. They're going to have high ranking government positions. Okay. We can look back the last hundred years very easily. All right. Most presidents, when they become president, they hook up the people that helped get them there. That's called the spoil system. This time period, that wasn't necessarily the way it was, right? We are living in a time period where, oh, your enemy might be your vice president, right? Like it was just different, all right? So Jackson's kind of changing that. But even though he's supported the spoil system, he does have this weird moral conscious thing too. Like Jackson doesn't have much of a moral compass, but sometimes he does, right? So he believed in something called rotation of office. He didn't want anybody to have a government job too long because he thought it might make them corrupt, right? So if they don't serve that long, he fires them, gets somebody else new in there, and then they're not corrupt, right? Like, because then you have a new person in that office. Okay. All right? Okay, let's pause on Jackson for a second. I want to talk about something that happens that has nothing to do with Jackson, but we use it as fodder for context for how the Civil War started, okay? Webster Heing debate. We had at 44. Man, we're not going to get very far today. Okay. The Webster Heing debate. Okay. So, Daniel Webster, we know him, right? Does everybody know uh, the, the television show Webster? I assume you guys all watch that. Done. Webster, sorry, Emmanuel Lewis. How old is this kid right here? How old do you think? And now, right in this picture. In this picture. Like three. He's like four years old. Okay, he's playing an eight-year-old kid. When the time this photo was taken, he's probably 15 or 16 years old. What? Okay, so Emmanuel Lewis, the actor, has this disease that like he aged, and then it's like I can't remember the name of the disease, but like you stop aging at a like at a spot. Like so, it's about eight years old. He just didn't look any older after that. So his mind continued to age, but his body was just it was done. Okay. Famous actor in the 1980s, had a show called Webster. It was a story about uh, a poor black kid who's adopted by rich white parents. And like it's a family show where it's like, you know, he has these struggles at school because he's black and he's going to like this white rich school and they don't accept him. But so there's always like a, a thing happening. But by the end of the, the episode, everything is solved. He talks to the parents, everybody's hugging and everybody's like, oh, it's feel good, right? It's like full house, it's like that kind of show, right? Okay. So we'll talk more about Emmanuel Lewis later uh, because there's other things that happen with him uh, that will relate to history. But I'm just introing him today. So anyway, but the show was called Webster, <laughs> Webster, Haynes, Hayden, right? Okay. All right. So Daniel Webster, Robert Hayne, get into a debate in Congress. Here's what's going on. There's a bill on the floor about the, how they're going to sell Western lands. The Western states don't like the bill. Okay. But they're only like one third of the country, if that, right? So it depends on how the South and the North feel about it, whether the bill's going to pass or not. Well, Robert Hayne, okay, is from South Carolina. He's actually a protege of John C. Calhoun. And he has this idea if I take the side of the West on this, because it doesn't really affect the South at all, but if I take their side, they're more likely to take our side in the future, right? So he's seeking, like, it's like a television game show, right? Like, an alliance. He wants to make an alliance with the West on this, okay? And he knows the North is going to go against this, so he wants to make this alliance with the West so that in the future, when it comes to the slave question, the West might be on his side, okay? So Robert Hayne gets up, starts supporting the West, but in the middle of this, he starts just ripping apart the North. Remember the Hartford Convention? Remember when during the War of 1812 when you guys kept taking the side of England, our enemy in the war, and you were like doing treason, right? And you guys keep passing tariff laws that hurt the southern part of the United States. We think it also hurts the West. 
Webster gets up and he's going to defend. He goes, hold on, you are attacking democracy. When a tariff gets passed, that is passed by elected officials. They're elected by the people. If you don't like the tariffs, then vote those people out of office. Put people in office who don't like tariffs. But this is a democracy. You don't throw it, throw everything out just because you lost that, that debate. Okay? So what's happening? We're seeing a wedge being driven in between the North and the South with the Webster Hain debate. Okay? It's just further separating those sections of the country. Okay? We got four minutes left. I'm gonna handle one more ID. The Peggy Eaton affair. Peggy Eaton is the wife of the Secretary of War. I think his name is John Eaton, maybe. Okay? There's a problem. None of the wives of the cabinet members will hang out with Peggy Eaton. You know why? She got she was divorced. Then she married this John Eaton guy within like a year of being divorced. And that was taboo. We can't hang out with her. She has this bad reputation. Jackson hears about it. Who does this remind him of? His dead wife. You think Jackson's happy about this? No. Calls a cabinet meeting, tells his cabinet members, you better get control of your wives and make them hang out with Peggy E. She better feel welcome. Some of his cabinet members quit. He fires some of them because their wives refuse to hang out with them. He really wants to fire his vice president, John C. Calhoun, because it's really his wife that's leading the charge on all this. He just can't fire the vice president because the vice president's elected and he can't fire the vice president. Okay? So Jackson, is this is causing strife in his own administration. Why are we talking about this? Here's why. Because this is what's going to drive a wedge between him and Calhoun. They're going to start to hate each other. We will pause there and pick up uh, with this tomorrow, okay? Now listen, tomorrow, it's a goofy day. You guys are gonna go to fourth period and then come here after fourth period tomorrow, okay? Um, so that's how, like whatever, because of the weird schedule that we're in, all right? So after fourth period, you are coming straight here, okay? Um, so, you know, just realize that. All right, we will finish this uh, this lecture up. We'll play some games tomorrow. And then on Thursday, I need you guys to bring books so that we can uh, hit some essay stuff, okay? We got a 90 minute period. I can't lecture to you guys for 90 minutes. Like, that's insane. So I just thought like, hey, we'll play some games and you know, we're, uh, that'll like kind of start to help us review for your midterm, which isn't until December, but let's pop our uh, forgetting curve back up again tomorrow with some unit three stuff, okay? All right. We are done. About your dreams? It's about to say this later.